Well, welcome, folks. Uh, at whatever hour of the day it is, the midday it is for you on a Thursday, we hope that Bill was just telling us it's uh, 92 Fahrenheit in uh, in Texas and in, in Waco this afternoon. And I understand I'm sitting up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, so it's a little cooler here, but we're having, uh, I think we're going to be at about uh, in, in the low 20s today um, on a different scale. So it's, uh, it's kind of a nice afternoon. It's wonderful to have spring across, running right across the continent. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to the ASA uh, quarterly brown bagger events. Uh, my name is John Wood, and I'll be your host today for this one. And we're uh, really pleased to have Bill Jordan with us. Bill, welcome. And um, Bill's going to be uh, talking to us on a Christian approach to sustainable engineering. Uh, this is a, a topic that is close to Bill's heart. I know we've had conversations about it because Bill has been on the council for the, the executive council of the ASA for the last five years, and, and we've had uh, lots of conversations. And um, what we're going to hear this afternoon is we're going to listen to a presentation that Bill made on sustainable engineering, that is a Christian approach to sustainable engineering. And he gave this talk in 2017 at the ASA meeting in, at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. Now that's a pretty special place for Bill. He, he tells me that uh, did his undergraduate and master's work there. He and his wife met there. And Bill, I think you said you came to faith in, in that time. Is that correct? That's correct. I didn't meet my wife to five years later, but yeah. Okay. I did become a Christian while at Mines as well as learning a lot in my two degrees. Okay. So that's a pretty special place. And then uh, Bill wandered down the hill. If you've been in Golden and then down to Denver, to Denver Seminary, uh, ended up with a, <clears throat> a theology degree uh, and then has back to Texas to complete his PhD in engineering. Uh, spent his career, his, the uh, latter part of your career, Bill, was it at Baylor? I don't know, was your whole career at Baylor in engineering? Uh, I spent 20 years in the mechanical engineering department at Louisiana Tech University, which is in Ruston, Louisiana, in the northern part of the state. So I came to Baylor in 2005. Right. And he has just retired from his position there in Baylor. And uh, over the last few years, Bill has been on, those of you in engineering know what ABET is, the uh, accrediting association across the North America for engineering here in the United States. And he's been on that ABET accrediting board and doing campus visits and program evaluations. Uh, very, very important professional service. So lots of interesting things in the background, but the, <clears throat> the most interesting thing I think is what would we do uh, without engineers? What if engineers suddenly disappeared. What would the world look like? Well, that's one way to think about engineering. Uh, in fact, we would not be having this conversation, certainly in this medium. And uh, that's one way to think about it. But we're gonna turn to the other side of that is, we have engineers and is there a way that we can make engineering sustainable? And in particular, is there a way for Christians to think about that? Uh, that concept of sustainability in engineering. So we're going to listen, first of all, to uh, Bill's talk, and then we'll come back for a Q&A uh, session. So Mark, if you would uh, begin that presentation, and we'll listen. Yeah, sustainable engineering is something I've been thinking about for a long time. I began to pursue it more seriously last fall. Last summer, I stepped out of the department chair and did a sabbatical at Villanova University, which is one of the few places in the country with graduate program in sustainable engineering. My main time-consuming thing I did there is to take unofficially two classes in sustainable engineering. And what I'm saying today is very different than what I would have said if I gave this presentation a year ago. It's also pleased, I'm pleased to come back to my old home uh, my whole life changed when I was at Colorado School of Mines. I got two degrees in metallurgical engineering, so I learned a great deal about the real world, and that shaped my entire career. I also became a Christian in the fall of my junior year here at the Colorado School of Mines. So, but my, the whole trajectory of my life in terms of engineering and then 
my faith component happened while I was at this school. So the question is, why do I want to care about sustainable engineering? <clears throat> We've heard before, global population will continue to grow. What I see is a really big problem, even more perhaps than that, is global affluence is growing. And as more and more people become middle class, they're going to want to live in lifestyles that's going to take up more energy and more of everything else. And some people estimate the human impact on the Earth may double in 13 years from now. And one of the ways to do that is to redesign our global technology. And sustainable engineering is certainly an aspect of that. So what is sustainable engineering? One of the things that's interesting, I teach an engineering ethics class every year, is how recently engineers, at least in an official sense, start caring about it. Individuals may have cared about it for a long time, but it's gotten in the engineering code relatively recently. ASME code says engineers shall consider environmental impact and sustainable development in the performance of their professional duties, which I think is a very positive statement. I try to figure out when did that first appear. I don't know when it first appeared, but as recently, at least to me, as 1992, it was not in the ASME code. Uh, another one, uh, NSPE is the National Society of Professional Engineers, an umbrella group. They say engineers are encouraged to adhere to the principle of sustainable development in order to protect the environment for future generations. The question is, when did NSPE decide this was important? In 2006. So as many engineers have come rather lately to this issue. Another example that had impact on me, I remember going on April 22nd, 1970 to the first Earth Day. There was one in Denver as well as every many other places. And I, I was interested, I wasn't a Christian at that point, but I was already interested in environmental issues. And Senator Nelson is the one who really created what we commonly think of as Earth Day. So what is sustainable development? NSPE has this really long definition, which is largely true, I think. We need, it's a challenge in meeting human needs for natural resources, products, energy, food, transportation, shelter, and effective waste management while conserving and protecting environmental quality, the natural resource base essential for future development. So if one of my friends from church asks me, what is this sustainable development thing? I am not going to try to read them this uh, statement. I learned a much simpler one. When I was at Villanova University, and they say it's not unique to them, this definition, <clears throat> but no one really knew exactly where it came from. They define sustainable development with four words. I like their but It's enough for all, forever. And I really like that definition. We talk about for the for all part is the part about the growing affluence in our world. But the idea is forever. You know, I mean, we, we saw several plenary talks that talked about that issue of if the whole world has a middle class lifestyle, that doesn't necessarily mean the energy consumption of the U.S., but perhaps that of Europe would be less. But that's still going to put a real strain on the Earth's resources. So what's driving the engineering? You know, certainly there are government regulations. But what I found interesting as a result of my sabbatical experience is government regulations play a role, but it's not the only thing. One of it is uh, the desire to do good, and companies are getting pressure from consumers to be themselves more sustainable. And I went to a forum at Villanova last fall. I had several people from major corporations say the people they are most thankful for for promoting sustainable development is this little company called Walmart. They require every one of their suppliers to have an end-of-use plan for the things they sell through Walmart, and they require all their suppliers to show their sustainability of their manufacturing of what they're doing. Now, do you think Walmart's doing this because they just want to feel good? No. Walmart's doing this because they can make money by it. They can make very much money by it by bragging about how good they are. So I'm not, some people will do things not necessarily from pure motives, but it still gets done. Another thing I, I know, I've seen even in my own younger son is companies are getting pressure from employees, particularly what you think of the millennials or people even after the millennials. They don't want to work for a company that is seen as not doing sustainability things. Another one is an ability to make more money. One of the things that was fascinating to me at my Bill Nova experience 
is they bring together co about 15 companies twice a year to their sustainable people talk about sustainability within their company. They don't have any competitors in the room. And uh, you could use anything you learn, but you can't say who did it because people still want their competitive advantage. The thing that was fascinating to me is this met the week after the election. And given some of the state policies of the then president elect Trump, I thought a lot of people there would be really discouraged. And that was not the case at all. Uh, a number of them said from the podium, the president's policies will have no effect on what we and our company are doing because we're doing the thing that's right. And by doing the thing that's right, we're making more money than ever before. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why <clears throat> I'm relatively hopeful because irrespective of what government might do, uh, people are finding out it's in their best interest. It's certainly related to climate change and pollution, but I think sustainable engineering is broader than that. And certainly global warming is part of climate change, but I don't think that's all there is to climate change either. But one of the things I think I could provide hopefully a little insight is on the side of why people are opposed to it. Uh, I, most of my friends are opposed to climate change or say it's not happening. But uh, from my own experience, I've been involved in politics on an extremely serious level for more than 25 years. You see there, I've been a delegate at one, two, three, four, five different state conventions, four in Louisiana and one in Texas. And I've been a national convention delegate in two times. So I, I know many of the people who, uh, at least on an individual level, are climate deniers. And I, climate change deniers, I think there's a different, a group of different types of people. Many people may be in one or maybe in more than one. One of them is, uh, so these group of people, one of them is, the, I think, the true believers who say there is no climate change occurring. Another one, and liberals believe in it, so it must not be true. <laughs> uh, but we live in a very polarized society. Uh, if one side proposes something, many people on the other side will reject it without listening to it. So, so it's true on both sides, but that is a real emotional reaction to, with lots of my friends. How can you support something that these liberals support? Another one, uh, and we've already heard uh, comments from the plenary speakers, climate change may be happening, but it's natural, and we can't do anything about it. And overlapping this one is, it may be occurring, but God's in control, and we have nothing to fear. God's not going to allow uh, the earth to be messed up completely. But there is another group that says climate change may be occurring, but because of their conservative nature, they don't like the big government solutions that have been proposed by many people. And I will be honest, when I think of my friends who are and others who are climate change deniers, I think this is the most influential of the group. I would put President Trump in this category. I mean, whatever, whatever else you think about. It. But the point is, people are saying, I don't like the solutions without having looked at, is it really happening? I think it's pretty clear it's really happening. I think that most of you in this room would say that. The question is, what do we do about it? And I think that's where people are open to change. I don't think the true believers are going to be convinced by more evidence. There's already plenty of evidence out there. But people who are bothered by governmental things, if you can show uh, market-based solutions, I think a lot of this opposition will end. So how I've changed. I've been committed to doing sustainable engineering, but I was basically, I call myself a mild climate change skeptic. My, but I changed my perspective when I was at Villanova University last fall. Some of you may not see my conversion as totally complete. I think part of the fight over this is there is some temperature data that's not consistent with other temperature data, and people could have legitimate discussions about it. But I liked, I think it was the first plenary speaker to talk about, what, 26,000 pieces of evidence to support climate change. So while I understand why some of my friends are want to argue the global warming temperature thing, I don't try to argue with that with them. I talk about all the other aspects. One of the things we looked at in our summer classes last fall was a reference called www.anthropocene. And uh, they talk about what's called the Great Acceleration. Lots of things began happening about 1950. Fertilizer consumption went up. So the initial OECD referred to basically Western Europe, Canada, U.S., Japan. 
BRICS, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, the BRICS are Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and then uh, everybody else. You see primary energy use has gone up dramatically. World population has, biosphere degradation has, ocean acidification. So what happened around 1950, do you think, that caused everything to start exploding? Any thoughts? What happened shortly before 1950? The end of World War II. We had this thing called World War II that devastated most of the industrialized world, at least in, in, in the European portion of the industrialized world, was pretty much wiped out. But the point is, uh, the countries had begun to recover by then, and things started changing very, very rapidly. Uh, here's a chart about growing affluence. This is the number of people who live on a dollar a quarter a day. And you see in 1981, it was close to 2 billion. It's on the order of maybe 1.3 billion, which is still a lot of people, but dramatically less. And while one of the speakers was most concerned about population growth, when I look at the issue of sustainable development, I think this is the biggest problem. The world is getting more affluent. And I don't think any of us would try to say that's bad intrinsically. I wouldn't want to, I've been on mission trips in Haiti. I've been to Rwanda five times with students. I don't want to live like the people in Rwanda or Haiti live, to be honest. And they don't want to live that way either. They want to live like we live. And I, that is one of the big issues that we, we face. So what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to deal with the complexity issues. I'm not trying to really do, deal with some of the details. I mentioned some of them to show how I became a believer in that climate change is real. But what I want to look at is the rest of this paper is largely theological. And I'm going to talk about two men named Francis. When I was a young Christian, I, one of the first books of Francis Schaeffer I read was Pollution and the Death of Man. A, uh, a Christian view of ecology in 1970. And then Pope Francis has, came out with the Laudato Si uh, in 2015. If you haven't read these two books, neither one is very long. I would highly recommend reading both of them. What's amazed me is how similar they sounded, even though they're written so far apart. Uh, their images are different. Schaefer is seen as a hardcore conservative, which is probably true. In the early 80s, he was an unofficial advisor to a number of sub-cabinet people in the Reagan administration. Uh, I think it's fair to say Pope Francis did not have a worldwide image of being a hardcore conservative. You know, uh, I was impressed, however, even though they're from different Christian traditions and 45 years apart, how similar some of the things they said were. Schaefer starts off his book by quoting from an article by Lynn White, who says our problems, this is 1968 or so, are not technological but stem from our worldview. Schaefer agrees with that. He doesn't agree with White's perspective is it's a Christian worldview that caused all the problems. Uh, Schaefer goes on to say, uh, the part in yellow, men do what they think, whatever their worldview is, this is the thing which will spill over into the external world. This is true in every area of life. Schaefer said it's a biblical view of nature that gives nature a value. It's not just a weapon, it's not just apologetics, but it's a value in itself because God made it. And then he says, when we have dominion over nature, it's not ours. It belongs to God. And we are to exercise our dominion over these things, not as though entitled to exploit them, but as things borrowed or held in trust. Uh, they're not ours intrinsically. And, and I'll have a quote in a few minutes from Pope Francis who says substantially the very same thing. Now, Schaefer doesn't sound too uh, conservative here. Why does strip mining turn the world into an absolute desert? What has brought about this ugly destruction of the environment? There's only one reason man's greed. If I put this up at the beginning without telling you who said it, I think most of you, or many of you would probably say that sounds like Pope Francis. And certainly, I think Pope Francis would agree with that. But this is spoken again by someone who is from a hardcore conservative background. He talks about early, Schaefer goes on to say it costs more money at first to treat the land well. And I might read the whole thing. He said, the question is, or it seems to be, are we going to have an immediate profit and an immediate savings of time, or are we going to do what we really should do as God's children? That we need to be concerned about the world God has made for us. 
Well, Pope Francis begins his uh, encyclical with a reference to Francis of Assisi. In fact, the title relates to a Latin phrase in Francis of Assisi. And he says, he reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. And if you read Francis of Assisi, he talked about being brothers to the birds and the animals. But one of the things I found fascinating <clears throat> is a lot of evangelical Protestants get real nervous when they say, see that. But certainly Schaefer would be in that conservative evangelical camp, and he doesn't say that. Uh, for the top part of that's interesting, he says, we have the right to rid our house of ants, but we have no right to do is to forget to honor the ants as God made it. When we meet the ant on the sidewalk, we step over him. I'm not sure I do that. <laughs> He's a creature like ourselves, not made in the image of God, it is true, but equal with man as far as creation is concerned. In this sense, Francis, this is the Vesisi, use of the term brothers to the bird is not only theologically correct, but a thing to be intellectually thought of and practically practiced. So he, some people have said Francis of Assisi had, had some really weird ideas. Schaefer is agreeing with the Pope. I know he wrote it 45 years earlier about that. So Pope Francis says, talking about St. Francis of Assisi, he said, faithful to Scripture invites us to see nature as a, a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. Rather than a problem to be solved, the world is a joyful mystery to be contemplated with gladness and praise. I think this statement resonates very well with uh, uh, Yancey's speech at the banquet, you know, about the wonder of God and the wonder of God's creation. So Francis says that he, he, he's motivated by the worldview also. He writes, and you see in the second paragraph here, convinced as I am that change is impossible without motivation and a process of it. I offer some guidelines for human development to be found in the treasure of Christian spiritual experience. He weaves three different uh, topics, uh, justifications. For One of them, he says, he's consistent with prior Catholic social teaching and quotes a lot of former uh, previous popes. I'm not in a position to evaluate that uh, one way or another. He also makes his recommendations. He says they're supported by good science. I don't agree with everything he says about the science, but I think that's probably largely true. What I want to look at is his recommendation is supported by scripture and other faith aspects. Uh, pope Francis says, we are not God. The earth was here before us and has been given to us. We must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute domination over other creatures. I find here uh, Schaefer and Pope Francis are saying basically the same thing 45 years apart. Fran the Pope says this responsibility for God's earth means human beings endowed with intelligence must respect the laws of nature and the delicate equilibria existing between the creatures of this world. He also said believers must feel a challenge to live in a way consonant with their faith and not contradict it by their actions. When people become self-centered and self-enclosed, their greed increases. The emptier a person's heart is, the more he or she needs things to buy, own, and consume. And that's a quote that my, many people would easily believe that's something the Pope would say. But in slightly different phrases, that's the same thing Francis Schaeffer said 45 years earlier. He said the problem with strip mining is greed. So where does all that lead us? I th this paper turned out to be more theological than I would have thought, and also a different theme than I would have thought a year ago. I think our Christian faith gives us many insights into problems of sustainable engineering. I again strongly recommend, if you haven't read, read the Dial C, which is easily in print. Uh, Schaefer's book, I believe, is still in print, or at least it's certainly readily available. And that, that's a bit older and a bit dated, but it really says many of the very same things. I think also climate change is real and important, and Christian engineers need to understand what role they can play. And there are issues of technology, and I didn't want to get into that because we could spend a whole conference about technology. But if you have many friends who are climate deniers, change deniers, as I do, uh, I think there's some strategies. I would say one, most Christians would say we need to be stewards of the world around us. 
if we emphasize that aspect, and, and you could talk about some of the climate change issues, uh, whether you want to talk about temperature or not, you can certainly talk about pollution and other things that are changing, and people would say, well, that's not a good thing to do. And then the last one is, to me, a more of a tactics approach. Many of my friends, even if they would become convinced climate change is happening, they'd say, well, I don't want to do what the liberals do. <laughs> and I'm not saying that what the liberals want is all bad. I'm not going to say that, but I'm just saying I think you can emphasize them. There are market-based things. I don't think the market will solve all the problems by any means, but I think it could go in conservative ways to dealing with this problem. So again, in summary, this is a different paper than I thought I was going to do a year ago. I started to think about this almost as soon as ASA, I left ASA. Uh, but my perspective has changed. I think it's changed for the better. At least it's, I think it's more faithful to the evidence. We see around us. Okay. Well, Bill, thanks again for that. It was interesting to listen. I'm sure you're, you're thinking back on a, a few years now. And... Uh, <laughs> reflecting on what you what you had to say then and and how well that's carried forward so we'll get into that with our question and answer i put a little note in the chat we'll use the raised hand function today uh if you have a question that you want to ask uh just go ahead and and uh, you could find that in my case it's along the bottom of the, scre the screen in the uh, reactions and uh you can go ahead and just uh you know put your hand up uh as true as I have done there, and then we'll go ahead, I'll be able to ask you to unmute. Or if you have a question or a comment, you want to put it in the chat, go ahead and do that. So let's, um, let's get right to the questions, and I'll save uh, you know, my reactions for a little later. And uh, I see I'm going to start with uh, Fred Cannon. Fred, would you please unmute and uh, go ahead and ask Bill. Yeah, so Bill, that was a very important talk. I remember uh, reading Francis Schaeffer's book back about the time when he, he wrote it. Uh, it occurs to me, you might have known my brother at Colorado Seminary, uh, Doug Cannon. Um, he, he was there probably about the same time you were. I, I remember the name, but I don't remember him as a person. But I do remember the name. Yeah, he's, he's been in China for 40 years now. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so NSF deals with these issues a whole lot, and I've been very active in the research through NSF and to deal, deal with these topics. Um, and a lot of the issues are very doable. Um, I, I, I've presented a similar uh, presentation to my classes here at Penn State, uh, uh, not, not getting into specifics like Francis Schaefer and Francis Collins, or, or um, Francis, uh, Pope Francis, but but more from the perspective of we're running out of things and sustainability means making it available to our grandchildren and, and yet others. So an interesting thing to think about is from the time Francis Schaeffer wrote that 50 years ago till now, uh, we only have 50 more years of carbon-based energy, basically. Uh, so some of the people in this room will be running out of carbon-based energy in your lifetimes if we use it at the same rate as we are now, but it'll probably be faster. Um, I agree a lot of the answers should be uh, market-based, and that's what I've devoted my life to a lot uh, in, in, in helping founders, for example, make the same products but pollute one you know, pollute half as much, for example, things like that. Uh, so I very much applaud what you're doing and, uh, and encourage you to keep moving forward with it. Uh, what are specific market-based solutions that you can think of uh, and, and uh, how, how can we implement them? Uh, in general, <clears throat> I would say when you go out to make a major purchase, look at what sort of sustainability things that company is doing that might affect what you pay for, what you buy. Another one is just what's going on with me personally. Uh, we've signed a contract to get solar power onto our roof of our house, hopefully within the next month. Our goal is to not have the battery system that costs so much more, but 
a net zero electric charge where we'll sell electricity to the company during the day and buy it back at nighttime. But that's an example where I think government plays a role. We could not afford that except for the very large uh, tax credit you get for putting solar on your home. So to me, that's an example of a quite legitimate use of government power. They're not forcing anybody to go solar, but they're saying we'll help subsidize you going solar. So when I said I, I believe largely in the marketplace, I think that's an example where the government can help the marketplace create solutions. So I'm looking forward to not paying any money to the, my utility on a monthly basis. Yeah. It's interesting you'd go to uh, the, the market-based conversation just yesterday uh, with my neighbor outside, um, two houses away, people are putting solar panels on their roof. And, and my neighbor has told me this before. She says, oh, they'll never get their money back. They're in their 70s. They're our age. And she said, they'll never get their money back. It'll never pay them back. And I, it's very interesting to me, uh, pluses and minuses of that one could be, to debate. But we almost always seem to go to those market uh, kinds of solutions, uh, you know, sort of first. And um, interesting, Fred, that you would say that uh, you spent a lot of time. I wonder, Bill, what's your experience on sustainable engineering? Is, is there a lot of conversation about the market side or is that spawned off to a different part of the academy? Uh, if you mean in terms of engineering education, uh I've taught a class that my last two years at Baker that I created about sustainable metallurgical engineering and market-based was a clearly significant part of that particular course. There's no way you could get around that. If people want to do something, uh, is this going to be a viable option? Now, part of the question of whether it's viable is do you need a break even five years or 10 years or 20? I mean, I think for my own solar thing, about five or six years will be starting to have lack of better term, make a profit off the deal. But I think that's a short enough time that it's, it's still the right thing to do. Yeah. All right, thank you. Kelly Vandegraaff, you're, uh, you're next. Very <clears throat> good. Good. Uh, first of all, Bill, uh, thanks for your presentation. I found it very interesting, uh, even though it's uh, five years old or something, four or five years old. Um, I, have, uh, I have about 10 questions, but I will limit myself to a few. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I did read uh, uh, Pope Francis' uh, book uh, when it came out. And the first few chapters when I read it, I said, right on until the final chapter. And the final chapter, I am sure, to put it bluntly, he did not know what he was talking about because he got into areas outside his area of expertise. Uh, how did you feel about that? Well, I, I think his overall approach was pretty reasonable. I think when he got down to specifics, he said a lot of things that are foolish or silly. I mean, an example would be one of the ones he suggested people turn off the air conditioning. That's not going to happen for those of us who live in Texas. You know, <clears throat> there's a lot of things I would give up before air conditioning if I had a budget crunch. So I agree. He, some of his specific recommendations, I think, were on the foolish range if not worse. But uh, what I like is his general approach, I'll put it that way. But I agree, he's speaking way out of his expertise knowledge when he talks about air conditioning and other things. Okay, good, we agree on that. Uh, I also want to, uh, I, I like your graphs that you had on your, your, uh, on your presentation. And the fact that you pointed out that uh, as we uh, try to raise the level of uh, comfort for all people, we need to use more energy. And, and that brings me back to the energy point, because I think in the final analysis, it all comes down to energy. It all comes down to energy. And to, uh, although I, I applaud your uh, plan to put on solar, solar panels and the same thing with John's neighbor, two doors down, um, it's, it's doable. Um, I live in southern Manitoba, and uh, my roof is oriented uh, in the wrong way. Uh, my house faces uh, uh, east, so the main axis is north-south, and uh, it's covered by stone year-round. Uh, but that's, that's the way it is. But my, my problem with, uh, with the sustainable te technology is that when the power goes off, or when you cannot supply your energy, as we see in, in Germany right now, 
you have to still rely on the install capacity. So the install capacity has to be maintained. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay for it, then your neighbors who uh, don't have solar, solar panels will have to pay for it. So I wonder how you see that as being good neighbors. I, I don't quite follow the, the solar about whether you're good neighbors or not. I mean, uh, your comment about wind, I think, is a, is a much more problematic uh, solution because only when the wind blows do you get energy. But the other huge issue with wind power is there's lots of massive wind farms in West Texas where it's very desolate and there's a lot of wind, but very few people live there. So you have to, how do you store the wind energy, electricity from the wind energy, and then how do you transport it? So I think wind, I don't see wind as being a real solution, except kind of at the margins. I think solar, obviously, like you mentioned in Manitoba, it has limitations, but I think it's much more helpful in a lot of other ways. So I'm not exactly sure what you meant about the good neighbor part, though. Oh, the point, uh, am I still, the point I want to make is that the uh, society has invested money into the utilities. Um, the utilities have to have power available on demand for the user. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to, uh, if you want to have the best of both worlds, in other words, if you want to have uh, renewable technology in the form of wind power or solar power or whichever, um, and there is a period where that state that uh, source of energy is not available, then you will still need to use the the utility power. I think if you went off if you went off off uh, offline, I have no problem with that. Right, but if you still want to rely on the uh, the national or state grid or provincial grid that has to be be there, you don't pay for it if you don't need it. But those of us who cannot either afford it or cannot, have not, uh, or cannot have it for e economic or uh, uh, atmospheric reasons still have to pay for it uh, to maintain utility. I live, as I said, in southern Manitoba. Our main electric power supply is hydro. And we flooded large areas of that. Uh, and uh, we have to pay for our usage of the hydro for hydro. Uh, plus operation, plus the uh, uh, pay for the building of the dams. So if half the province were to opt out of that and build solar panels, then the rest of us would have to pay more to pay up. I understand power. what you're saying now. I, uh, I don't ever foresee realistically that half the people would go solar. You know, I mean, you know, I think we can make a big help if we could get 10 to 15 to 20 percent to go solar, because I recognize that in many areas, there will be people who are unable to go isolate themselves from the grid, whether it's solar or some other means. So I think, yes, there's still going to be a need for a traditional power company in Waco, Texas area. You know, so I don't see solar as the savior of everything where everything is solar, but I'm seeing more and more applications where. We're not the first person in our neighborhood to get solar. We're probably the fifth or sixth person in this two block region to get solar. But I don't see everybody doing it. That's, a, that's, that's, an, excellent que that's an excellent question and a good responsibility. What you see is that it's not just a technical question of the infrastructure, the technology one puts up, but it's also the question of, of economics and then we've raised the question of fairness and the common good. So uh, oftentimes in, in the environmental classes that I do introductory classes through my career with, with students, you begin to ask these questions and you get exactly to this, who pays? Is it fair to everyone? And how does this, how does this technology work? It's a couple of responses to that. These are not new questions that have just popped up with solar or with climate change. I mean, I'm thinking back to E.F. Schumacher's uh, Small is Beautiful uh, back in the 1960s and the 70s. He was, uh, came out of the British coal industry in the 50s and the 60s and took a look at this question of how do we space heat? And in that case, it was not uh, solar, but there it was nuclear. He was asking the question is, why do we need millions of degrees of temperature to to raise water to steam to generate electricity, 
when we're what we're really trying to do is just warm our house from the background temperature of 40 Fahrenheit or so in the outside to a comfortable 70. And so what he did was change the kind of question you ask. And I think what this solar power is doing for us, as is wind, uh, as hydro did when it came in, it's changing the questions that we ask. And part of it's technology, but part of it's asking these questions of, of fairness, and it gets into economics questions. Which well, One comment I would make, and then we'll go to the next question, is that no source of energy is without cost to environmental issues. Certainly, while I think solar will help in many ways compared to, say, coal-powered, which is what I normally live on here, right. there's still the pollution of the issue of making of the panels. But even the hydro thing, in my ethics class, I show pictures of Glen Canyon Dam in Arizona, which powers most of Phoenix, or maybe all of Phoenix with electricity. And then I show pictures of Glen Canyon before it got flooded by, lake, by the lake. And I, don't, mm -hmm. I can't conceive there'd be another dam of that size built in the U.S. just for political reasons. So there was a different attitude in the 50s you know, about things of that nature. But that's the other issue. That it's a cost. I think you could justify the dam, but there are issues with everything. Yeah. I think there's a question, Graham. There is a question. Graham, you've been waiting patiently. No, a lot of things. This is really one of my hot buttons. So it's, it's great to have this group and this information out. And uh, uh, boy, there's so many things that it brings to mind immediately. So I, I got the laundry list. I won't explain it, but uh, attitude is so important. And I remember a few years ago, I read something that said, we do not inherit the world from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. You think of what we're doing to the earth and how to change attitudes and how we want to see our kids do well and our grandkids do well. I'm scared to death that my kids and grandchildren are going to run into uh, huge problems in you know, 20 years from now. And so I think in terms of, you know, what can I do? And, you know, as a homeowner, you say, okay, if I stop burning oil and get a heat pump, I'm taking heat that's in the uh, environment and moving it back and forth into my house and out of my house whether I'm heating or air conditioning. So I'm getting it done soon. Uh, another thing that's really big, I think, is that and I worked in industry for 40 years, 45 years. So it made a little different perspective. But industry runs everything on a profit mar uh, model, and, and which is which is good, except they don't have to pay the full cost. Like your example about strip mining, well, they don't have to re uh, restructure that ground to the place where it's forests or uh, grasslands or whatever. They get a free ride on that. They don't pay the full cost. But for those of us in manufacturing. You look at things like yield and you look at ter in terms of, you know, what does it cost to, to build this? And just improving yield can have a huge, huge effect. I uh, worked, uh, I, I was a supplier to McDonald's Corporation for oh, a good number of years and I was the engineer responsible for that. We developed a product for McDonald's that helps them cook their hamburgers more uniformly, they don't stick. When a hamburger uh, sticks to the grill, they have to chisel it off and throw it away. And we eliminated that. And just for fun, I did a back calculation. Because there are 35,000 uh, McDonald's stores, the numbers are become huge. But saving, reducing their loss by a, about 15% eliminates 400 million pounds of carbon dioxide equivalents every year, year after year. And that's just yield. And it's something that they want, but they don't, they don't always think of it that way. You know, their perspective has to change a little bit in terms of sustainability is important. Uh, and does it, you know, you know, and that sort of thing. And look at it. I'm, I'm convinced that that can be done in all of industry because they don't worry about waste that much, even with expensive materials. 
I think there's a lot of uh, good points about what you just said that, you know, when you look at kind of these more, I would say, marketplace solutions frequently, they may cost you more money in the short run, but save you money in the long run. An example, one of the things we heard at Villanova is the furniture maker Ikea, his goal is to sell 100% of the wood that comes into their factory, you know, whether it's powderized or whatever shape it is. The idea is they want to not throw as much away, but by doing that, that means they're selling more stuff too. But again, it's going to take some extra energy, extra cost initially. Yeah. I see a question Thanks. here on the chat yeah. from someone. Yeah, who I was going to ask that. I was going to ask that, Bill. It's a good okay, question. Go it has come in from uh, David Wing. Go ahead. And it's ask. on the notion of unintended consequences. According to all technologies have that. Could you speak generally to that notion? I mean, I know this comes up in engineering training that you intend to do well, one thing and one, something else One happens. example, Maybe. I would say, and this is not necessarily a sustainable issue, but it could be in some regards, is this little thing called an iPhone or its competitors has so many unintended consequences. I didn't think, I don't think the Apple people when they created it thought they were going to destroy the camera market and the film market in the United States, but they've largely done that because a huge majority of the photos people take are now on their smartphones. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one example. That's, you could argue that's environmentally friendly because you're not developing negatives and prints anymore, or at least not very many people are. Mm -hmm. But that's clearly a, a huge unintended, uh, I think, uh, consequence. Mm -hmm. I think Graham got at one in his comment about uh, here in the chat as well. 60% so of wind energy is dumped to ground, that is wasted, because of the lack of storage capacity. Uh, think about wind energy. Think about solar power. Bill, have you done anything in that area on storage, the storage capacity? Well, the, uh, I think that's in my opinion, the biggest issue of why I don't see so, uh, wind power being more than a kind of peripheral thing because lots of places where there are wind are not where there's people. I think solar is not going to ever replace traditional energy, but there's a lot of places like here in Texas that solar will work very well because we have a lot of sunshine uh, for a lot of the year. So I think some of these things uh, will be more something that can be continued more so than some others. I'm scanning up here to see, Bill, if we have another question. I, I wanted to ask you, it came up earlier. This is a five-year-old talk. If you were to give it today, what, you know, look, you look back on it. What do you think about that talk? Has it worn well? Would you change things? <laughs> I would change in the fact that I'd have new data on some of this information, but uh, I don't think I'd change my fundamental conclusions. First, that we do need to develop a Christian approach to sustainability, that that's the right thing to do. And that uh, certainly my conviction that climate change is occurring is, is we got more and more examples of that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm beginning to see among some of my conservative friends a warming to the idea that maybe we can do something about it as long as we keep government out of it. And I'm not saying we should always keep government out, but there's a lot of people who would think that. So I, I'm still pretty optimistic about the sustainability thing. I think it's going to be a mixed bag in that some parts of the country can more easily use sustainable uh, sources. I think of areas in Arizona and California that live off of uh, hydro from uh, Hoover Dam, you know, but, and also people like Texas or Florida where solar power is very uh, a live option for many people. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I think it's gonna be hard to do this <clears throat> uh, sustainable engineering everywhere because of the different issues of where people live. But I think my general conclusions haven't changed. Some of the specific examples probably would have. All right, Bill, thank you. Okay, we've got two repeat questions. I always say, I let everybody ask uh, one question before I have you ask a second, but uh, seeing what we've got here, Fred, go ahead and, uh, and ask a second question. We've got about five minutes or so here before we wrap up. Yeah, so I, I wanted to respond to the comment about 60% of wind energy is wasted to the ground. Uh, there's two kinds of issues that we want to deal with. One is what is 
non-resolvable and what is something we can resolve with time. So mm. I, th I think the costs of, for example, storage of energy are going down quite a bit. The, the possibilities of transferring energy uh, longer distances are, are becoming part of what we do as infrastructure. Uh, so th those are surmountable issues. A question I sometimes ask the students that I teach is, okay, so somewhere between 10 and 15% of our energy now is renewable. Does the amount of solar and wind and hydropower infrastructure annoy you to the extent that you wouldn't want more? For example, what if there were 10 times as many places that had solar power and wind energy? Would that annoy you? That solves a problem. Uh, for now, anyway. I mean, by then, we'll, we'll be using twice as much energy, probably. But, but I, 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 what, what is dramatic is that the cost of solar power and wind energy is now the same as the cost of coal energy, for example. That really changes the, 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 mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. With gas prices doubling and tripling, a lot of things that were way too expensive to do just five years ago are now very, very competitive. So let's seize the market now and, and move these things forward. Is my thought. Well, I think there's, <clears throat> I agree with what you basically what you said. And sometimes we just have to take one step at a time. I told the story of our solar panels we're going to have installed. We're not getting the battery system right now because of the cost. <clears throat> but ultimately, we want to get that after we kind of pay off the panels themselves. Because right now, those solar panels won't help me if the power grid goes down because I'm buying and selling every day. Yeah. You know, uh, so Eventually, I'd like to get independent of the grid, but that's not something we can do right away. But I think one of the problems some of you have with sustainability is they see this whole problem is really big. And uh, the issue is, what can I do about it now? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a limit to how much you can do, but we all in a position to do uh, something uh, at this time. You know, I'm reminded of the statement many years ago, uh, and relating to hunger is how do you feed a hungry world? The answer is one person at a time. You know, so I mean, I can choose to save energy uh, for which will help others as well as helping myself, but I can't do everything all at once. Bill, I think that's a nice segue into a question that Derek Skirman has put in here. It's it's really an observational question, maybe a thought question, but it's on a whole: Have Christians become a helpful voice? Do you think in promoting sustainability? Or are you still hearing resistance? I think across, you've, you've mentioned uh, your friends and your, and your church there, but I also see you, uh, I know you're working with uh, accrediting engineering programs, and I, I see that as, as Christians taking action professionally. So just think about that. Uh, do you see Christians, uh, you know, anecdotally, your friends and your church meetings? And do you see us systemically in any way really taking action on, on promoting sustainability? Uh, I think it's beginning to change. It certainly have a long ways to go. I'm not the only Christian person I know in this area who's doing a little bit with solar power. You know, I'm, I'm one of the other engineering fact has already beat me to a solar system in his home, for example. Mm -hmm. But so I think it's beginning to change, but we still got a long ways to go. But I think helping people understand there's a difference between is there a problem and what specific solution do we choose to implement? And I think at the big picture of is there a problem, I think we're making progress in people understanding that there's a problem. So Charlie Vandegraaff, I wanna ask you, uh, I'll let you unmute and ask one short question. And so we can wrap up on time here if you have one. <laughs> Very okay, good. Okay, here we go. Uh, I won't ask a question, but I'll make a few comments. And it, 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 one of them is, uh, to what extent should Christians hold uh, look in the mirror? Uh, and to what extent are we uh, part of the problem? Um, uh, I had a discussion with a friend some years ago, and uh, we started talking about energy. And I said, how do you heat your church building? Oh, he said, by natural gas. I said, why don't you go to electricity? 
Oh, we said, we couldn't afford that. We can barely make our budget. All right. So there's an angle as well. Right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I had no choice. We have no gas here. We have to use natural gas. We have to use hydro. So we use hydro. Right. But, you know, how many Christians uh, could make that switch from natural gas to hydro? And, and another point to be made is I still get church magazines with ads in it for cruise ships, cruise liners. Cruise ships are an enormous producer of greenhouse gases. They serve no other purpose. They transport no goods. They just transport people from one harbor to the next harbor and bring them all back safely, except the ones who die of COVID, of course. No. So, so my, on that, question, my question yeah. is, that's my, that's my point, basically. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. On the cruise ship issue, um, I used to be tempted to, to join you, but then my daughter came up to me and said, uh, Dad, uh, we're going to get married in the Bahamas. And we're going to go on a cruise. And I said, I said, honey, you know, you can get married here in the church and it's free. <laughs> We're members. <laughs> and guess what we did? <laughs> so um, there are there are other values besides uh, that are at work there. And you're right. It's not goods and services, but it, it sure kept the, the family happy. And uh, three grandchildren later uh, and a happy wife. I'm having a good life from having gone. I think that just shows the complexity. And I don't think any one of us can be totally, absolutely consistent in, in how we live in this area. I have to admit my bias. My wife and I went on a cruise this January in the middle of a pandemic and came through without yeah. getting sick. So. And with, with that, Bill, we just all want to thank you. You can use the reactions and clap hands to uh, give Bill a, a thank you for his talk and for his Q&A with us today. Um, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to sit and think together uh, with folks that have thought about these for a long time. So- uh, Well, I've enjoyed being with you all. I'll be glad to interact with you all in other venues. I hope to see many of you in San Diego. Well, that was where I was going, Bill, because uh, we have a, an excellent uh, slate of plenary speakers, contributed papers, uh, activities, uh, workshops, some very interesting workshops this year. And folks, there are, uh, we've given out 19 scholarships so far. We think that for students, we think that's going to go up over 30 or more. Uh, we've got contributed posters uh, from students, and uh, it's going to be a, a very interesting conference, we think. And so uh, it is the early bird special right now, between now and next Tuesday, if you, uh, uh, you get a nice discount if you register, so I'd encourage you to do that and talk to your friends. I want to thank you all for this. Thanks, uh, Becky English and uh, Mark McEwen on the technical side of keeping this going. And we will uh, see you online on a Diving Deeper or another Brown Bagger uh, in the future. Have a great day.